Praise be to God. Praise be to God. While you're standing there, hallelujah. Can you do that for God? Because it'll get a lot louder if we give God the glory. It won't. Hallelujah. Glory. 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 All right. And stay there for a minute. While he's right there on the organ, if you catch what we're about to do, can everybody put one hand over your heart and raise one hand to heaven? And we're going to take that glory where we just gave God the praise. And that was a wonderful, as we clap our hands and lift our hands, heaven is responding. So now we're going to sing again one more time, just the end of this. And you could do harmony. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Now another hand clap, how about it? For God, for Jesus, for Holy Spirit, glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Woo, somebody wants to shout. Go ahead, that's all right. Hallelujah. You can say hallelujah one more time. Now, now, real quick, because I really am going to give you my pro-life testimony, but the Spirit of the Lord is asking me to remind you, we're right in something called Easter season or resurrection. And some of our intellectuals and Bible scholars, and I know some are sitting up here, but you're out there too. Well, we can't say Easter because Constantine took idol worship, and changed it to Easter. But you know what? Jesus rose, right? And every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So happy Resurrection Day. And Jesus arose up over Easter, way up over Easter. So glory to God. You can be seated if you can. Now you all are watching a miracle because four weeks ago I broke my foot, right? Now I, I, I was doing something that my granddaddy, Daddy King, would have called nibbling sweet grass. In other words, I was looking at something I didn't need to look at. I was walking along a curve. And there was a movie out called Black Panther, which I like. It's a great movie. It, it really has forgiveness. It has love. It has repentance all in it. But there was a lady who was dressed up in this beautiful African garment, and she was trying to take a picture and pretend she was an actress in Black Panther. So I was looking at her, not looking at the curb. It fell, my foot fell off the curb, right? So it cracked. And I said, Lord, let me pay attention to the mission you sent me on and what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I walked on it eight days. It did hurt a little bit. Now, really, it did. But I, I, I'm kind of a low tolerance, high tolerance for pain, and I was busy for the Lord. So I got on an airplane on day seven, and the foot puffed up, okay? So I said, well, I'll go by urgent care. God, Christ is my healer, and I'm healed, but I'll go by urgent care. So I get to urgent care, and so the uh, medical uh, personnel looked at me. She said, um, ma'am, did you know your foot was broken? I said, where did you, she said, where did you hurt? I said, eight days ago. She said, are you serious? Well, we're going to rush you over to the orthopedic surgeon and all this. So I got home. I, I called all the prayer warriors, and I said, God, you really are the healer. And I thank you. And my foot is healed. It started itching, so I knew the power of God was flowing through the foot. So I go to the orthopedic surgeon. He said, well, ma'am, uh, uh, yes, it, it is broken, but uh, you don't seem to be in an extreme amount of pain, so we don't have to do surgery. We thought we did, but no surgery. And no cast. And you can wear that boot if you want to if the pain is too great. And come back and see me in four weeks. So I'll be going to see him in just a few days. But I'm able to walk with very little discomfort. No pain, but a little bit of discomfort. And so the Lord is a healer. I wanted to tell you that. Now, Bishop Wooden already told you God can heal a spirit, soul, or a body. So even if you've had abortions like me and Black ladies really don't like for me to say that in public. No ladies do really, but black ladies, wait a minute, hello. Uh, 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 where's your long skirt? Where's your Bible? 
how are you out in public saying you had an abortion and Jesus forgave you and healed you? What's wrong with you? Put your religious look on. Don't tell people how good God is and that he healed you. How Jesus Christ died for your sins and his blood covered all of them. Don't tell them how Holy Spirit is leading you into all truth. Don't say that. Just make sure your hat's on straight and your dress is all right and your lipstick is on or whatever. But you know, Jesus really did heal me and I'm going to tell you about that in a moment. In a moment, but I first want to thank um, Bishop Wooden and First Lady, and I, I've got, if you don't have this, Unborn Lives Matter, to the God of the Bible, please get it, Bishop Wooden, and then ladies, we could learn a lot from First Lady Wooden and, and the Book of Ruth, <laughs> honestly, and, and these caught my eye while I was here, and I said, can I have those to go and study, because I'm like this, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And I need to hear it all the time. I, I was talking to my son, and he's recently born again. If, you, if you're 40 and under, can you stand up for a minute? I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm 67. That's all right. But if you're 40 and under, several years ago when our daughter, who's married now, she's in her 30s, when she got her first job, she gave me an iPhone. This is a 10. She gave me my first iPhone. And she said, if you don't learn how to do something called tweet, you'll never speak to me again. So guess what I found out? This has a Bible on it as well. So when the young people are doing some things that seem to be not spiritual, not religious, or whatever, I do have several Bibles, and uh, my Bible's on my phone tonight. So, uh, and if you're 40 or under, you pretty much know how to use these pretty well. I'm not too good with mine. I do okay, but I can find Psalm 127 that we're going to read. You can sit down give God the glory, but the millennials and the young people get it. And so I um, want you to forgive me. I'm not going to do the paper Bible. I'm going to ask you to turn to Psalm 127. So if you've got your, this kind of Bible or your paper Bible, Psalm 127, because I need you to read with me. Okay? It's a very, we're going to read that whole scripture. I just had it on. Okay, here it goes. Psalm 127. I'm in the King James Version, and uh, a lot of times we know that's the authorized version. However, there are some other versions, and I read. Does anybody have a parallel Bible? Is it okay if you have one? Can you raise your hand and say you have one? Where there's two or three versions side by side, and sometimes that helps too. But King James, read along with me. And okay, here we go. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. You don't need sleeping pills with this one, do you? Hallelujah. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them, they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Hallelujah. Give God the glory. Now go to Acts 17, 26 real quick. These are the three we're going to talk a little bit, uh, but we'll move back and forth through, through these. Acts 17, 26. to get past some on this and get over to Acts 17 and 26. This is very important because we're going to talk about Planned Parenthood, having a plan to minimize minorities based on a lie that we are separate races. Acts 17 and 26. Okay, we, we just, this is a scriptural foundation because you wouldn't believe me if I couldn't prove it, if God didn't prove it for you. So Acts 17 and 26, we're going to read it out loud because this, this one is a hard, people push back on this, they don't like to hear this one. Okay, 23 to 4, 25, 26. Read with me. And has made of one blood all nations of men or people for to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Let's read a little further. That they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him 
though he be not far from every one of us. So let's think about that. We all think we're different races, or we used to, but now we're really finding to get all these DNA tests and things they can do. Because uh, in, in my family, it was kind of strange because everybody's brown, and every once in a while, somebody pops up real pale, right, like I did. And so we were trying to figure out, my brothers were so mean when I was born because they were so pretty, and here I was looking like this with a widow's peak that I kept trying to shave off because I didn't get it. We don't know where they got you. They must have adopted you. You are ugly something. Now, this my brothers would say this behind my parents' back. So my Aunt Woody saw me crying about it one day. She said, baby, some of our people are from Ireland, okay? So everybody would go back and forth about that. But I had an opportunity to go to Ireland a couple of times. And Granddaddy wrote in his book, Martin Luther King Sr., about his grandfather, Nathan Branham King. And, and he was from Cork, all right? Now, Big Mama's Granddaddy. Willis Williams was a slave preacher. Now, a long time ago, and your pastor can tell you this, and you can, you've probably heard it, you can study it. A long time ago, during slavery here, they would pull out the only parts of the Bible they would give to blacks. They had two or three pages in it. Slaves obey your master, the Lord, right? And so, but that was about all that they could study. But Willis had the whole Bible, and he would teach the whole Bible, and they couldn't make up stop. So finally, the slave masters would go over and listen to and so let's bring this up to 21st century because I make a lot of people mad when I say we're one blood, one race, we're not separate races. And I said, okay, if you're going to keep slaves, obey your master and all that, why don't you all look up Jubilee where every seven years you're supposed to let us go and give us, you know. <laughs> one blood. Martin Luther King Jr., out of Acts 17, 26, learned from his daddy, and his granddaddy, my daddy, A.D. King, did too. We, we grew up on that. Of one blood, God made all people to live together on the face of the earth. So if we're one blood, then he says we must learn to live together as brothers, I added sisters, or perish together as fools. So that's where that Acts 17, study it when you get time. And study Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. Children really are a gift from the Lord. And, and Bishop was just telling you, and I saw this in the 90s. I think I was flying on airplanes everywhere doing what I do now. And I said, kept saying, where are all the black people? So one day I came to my pastor, Alan McNair, before he passed away. His, his son, Teddy, is doing a great job now with his first lady. His wife's first lady. And so Mama McNair is the matriarch of the church now. But I said, Pastor. All the black people are being aborted. That's why they're not on the airplane. It just hit me like a ton of bricks. That's where we were. And it finally is being, being proven now. You heard the statistics tonight, and we'll talk about that a little more. So I said, oh, my God. Now, can we go to John 3.16? This is the foundation. And then we'll move on through after that. Because the last time I read it, and I know it's accurate, John 3. 16 and 17, really, if you don't mind. John 3. We're going to do 16 and 17. I, it's one of my favorite scriptures. Did anybody see the Apostle Paul movie yet? It's so beautiful. If you've not seen it, go and see that, too, because it, it was a favorite part. Luke was with Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul's at the end of his life. This is the only part I tell. If you haven't seen it, I won't tell you the whole movie. So Luke was mad with the people who were killing the Christians and worshiping idols, and he says, I, 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 they worship idols. So Paul says, so did you until you met Jesus. So what are you talking about? So don't we say, but by the grace of God, there go I. And see, that gives new meaning to that. And that's why you can stand in front of protesters and stand with students who believe exactly what you believe and some don't. And you can say, love never fails. It just doesn't. Doesn't mean I have to agree with that, you know. Any more than you have to agree if I do something I shouldn't do. But God still loves us. Let's read this, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but should have everlasting life. 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes, 18, on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
Now, in a few minutes, I'm going to open up for questions, so I want to give you my testimony. But God honestly does everybody. But look, look at it this way. God is the ultimate judge. And those who say everybody's going to meet God, they happen to be right. But you either have to be under the law or under grace. And there's a difference because we're going to meet the judge. So I used to, when I was teaching as a college professor, I would say to my students, I said, hey, we all going to meet God. That's true. You, don't, you really actually don't have to be a Christian to meet God. You are going to meet God. If you're an atheist, you are going to meet God. Whether you believe it or not, you are. And don't raise your hand. I started to say, anybody ever been to court? But don't tell me because then your neighbor will talk about you real bad. So don't do it. But since we all have to go to court, wouldn't it be wonderful if the judge was our Father? Our Father. Because that's where you're going to find grace and mercy. And then your works won't be judged because they're pretty much going to burn up anyway. But his love is going to cover you in the blood of Christ. So that's what happens in the abortion situation. And we just have to reach out and forgive it. I've met too many women who say, well, I actually believe God has forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. That's pride. So you bigger than God. God can forgive you, but you can't forgive you. So you, you're a bigger judge than God, huh? Let God forgive you and be washed in the blood and be healed and rise up like I did and become a voice for life. Because there's a thing, tell the truth and shame the devil. And so everything he tried to do to me, I told him many years ago, I said, I tell you what, you made a fool about out of me enough, but now every time you do it, I'm going to put it on the front page of the paper and say, you made me do it. Okay, so you're still going to look bad. Leave me alone. Get out of here in the name of Jesus. I bind you. I curse your work in Jesus' name. So I had to do that. Now, in 1950, my mom and dad, young people, were courting, not dating, because there's a difference. Only a man married to a woman needs to go on a date. The two of them need to go on a date. Everybody else, so you can chase butterflies, fly balloons, go get ice cream, do whatever you want. But the date takes you into sexual intimacy, and that's for that one man with that one woman approved before God that's ready to bear the fruit of that union. Now, if they're surrendered to God, the baby won't be aborted, won't be beat, won't be hurt. Everybody else needs to just court or just dedicate your life to God until you're ready to make the commitment, okay? So young people, if you're out that day, not old people, I'm not going to look because some old people try that too. You do. I know you do. I know. So just get that straight and make your priorities right and you'll be happier. So mom and dad were courting. My grandmama, Big Mama Bessie, made a big mistake. That's my mother's mother. She was a single mother. She uh, was married to a Native American man who went off because he had, couldn't, you know, the Native Americans couldn't work in the cities and things like that. He, he never came back. So Mama Bessie had my mother, okay? Bessie Barber. She was Bailey before she was Barber. Mom is Naomi Ruth Barber King. So Big Mama Bessie was a domestic worker, and she was a great cook and working in homes and things. And she raised Mama. They joined Ebenezer Baptist Church. My mother was schooled beautifully, and, and her clothes were prettier than a lot of other girls because Big Mama Bessie worked in a fine house, and the girl only wore the dress once or twice, and Mama ended up with a lot of them, you see. And so she was dressed and pretty and educated well. So they were courting in the 10th grade. And uh, Daddy, oh, that's my wife. I'm going to marry her. So Big Mama Bessie in 1950 made a huge mistake. They were engaged by now. And Mom was going to Spelman. And Daddy was going on to Morehouse. So, well, Nene, you're a good girl. And you and A.D. going to get married when you all get through so you all can go on a date. Now, didn't I just tell you what happened on a date? Okay, so they went on a date. Guess who showed up on the date? Because if you're too young, I don't want you to figure this out. So just figure it out. So here's mom, and uh, there was an organization in town called the Birth Control League. They were changing their name to Planned Parenthood. They ran two secret programs, the Tuskegee program, where they were giving the black men syphilis. Half the men got syphilis and half didn't to see how fast if how fast syphilis could run through the community and diminish the Negro population. That was really, look it up. And then there was another program, Tuskegee Project and the Negro Project. Oh, well, you are such a fine person. We can help you to be a credit to your race. 
get a vasectomy or tie your tubes. And then you can be a doctor or a lawyer or a businessman or whatever, okay? So it was already there. Abortion was illegal. Planned Parenthood back then would have told you they were against it because it was illegal. They weren't going to say we're breaking the law. They, they were too smart. So black folks were doing all that. They were passing out brochures and flyers, and the black girls were, and the boys were doing all this. So mother brings a flyer home, and uh, they kind of thought she was pregnant or figured, Mama, can we go over to this place? They'll help us. My grandma looked at us. She said, uh-uh, let's go talk to our pastor. His name was Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Sr., and he was going to be her father-in-law. He said, Nina, they're lying to you. That's not birth control and all that stuff. And that's not a lump of flesh. He said, that's my granddaughter. I saw her in a dream. No ultrasound. Three years ago, she has bright skin and bright red hair. And she's going to bless many people. And that was me. Okay? So I was actually born. Mom and daddy birthed five of us. And then Uncle Mel got married, and he and Uncle Retta have four children. Uncle Christine and Uncle Isaac had two. And that's the next, next part of the King family legacy. And then guess what happened? In 1966, Mark, Margaret Sanger, before she died, the founder of Planned Parenthood, who had said, colored people are like weeds. They need to be exterminated. But don't let, let's don't let that word get out. Let's give them scholarships and tubal ligations and vasectomies and all of this, and let's cultivate their best leaders. And that's how you got all those black doctors and lawyers and business people doing abortion and stuff because they got the scholarships from that foolishness, okay? So we had all this, 66, they invited Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., my uncle, to accept the first Maggie Award, Planned Parenthood. Guess what he said? No, 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 I'm not going to do that. Uncle Retta, his wife, who very much like me, because I used to believe all that stuff too, a lot of women were buying it. And we thought the men were trying to oppress us. So she went and she received the award, read a speech somebody else wrote. Her, his secretary wrote the thank you note, and they tried to accept it in the name of Martin Luther King Jr. Study your history. He didn't go. He didn't write the speech. He didn't read it. He didn't, he didn't write the thank you note. So some of you all out there, well, if she went, that was her husband. And I'm really don't, I'm not going to even look on this one. I'm going to cover my eyes. Wouldn't it be nice if all husbands and wife totally agreed about everything every day? Uh-huh. But we don't always. Sometimes you have a husband and wife, different political parties, go to different churches. One won't go to church, one will. Won't look at the same, won't use the same toothpaste and get in the fight if one squeezes in the wrong place. Don't laugh too loud. I'm going to try to figure this out if you laugh too loud, see. So they didn't, they loved each other deeply, and she was a very supportive wife. She supported her husband. She just had a different worldview. So that happened. Uncle Mel was killed in 68. My dad was actually, walked me down the aisle in 69 as a virgin. I, I got to tell this. I'm not out of time. We still going to have time for a few questions. If you have a question, write it on your yellow card under where it says questions or comment. We'll take them up in a few minutes. There should be some yellow cards out there. I, I hear you, Pastor. I, I, I'm good. Okay, so here we are. And the only reason young people 40 and under, I was a virgin when I got married. I really used to think I was ugly. Because the boys, we had a game called spin the bottles. They wouldn't play with me. Nobody wanted to even stand next to me. So I said, what's wrong? It took until this century. I'm serious. James Orange, before he died, all the civil rights, like, girl, you were the prettiest ward out there, but your daddy said he had a nonviolent baseball bat. <laughs> so unbeknownst to me, and my daddy and Uncle Martin Luther King Jr. used to chase Aunt Christine's boyfriends around and run them away till they approved of Uncle Isaac. So here I was, nobody would touch me. So daddy walked a virgin down the aisle. It wasn't so much that I was so pure and nice and all that. But daddy protected me. Uncle LeBell was doing that. That's what the men and I felt it did back then. And the mothers and women stood up to it. And they taught us how to dress, how to act, how to set a table, how to study our, our French lessons and our lessons in school, and how to be respectful to our husbands and all that kind of thing. And so we were raised that way. But guess what happened? 
daddy was killed the year after Uncle Emil was killed. I was married, but I still had a doctor that was affiliated to with Planned Parenthood after he birthed the first baby, did an involuntary DNC instead of a pregnancy test for my second baby, that was my first abortion, sent me to Planned Parenthood who gave me, um, I, my first my baby was born, then I had the abortion, went to Planned Parenthood who helped me get another one legally in 1973 after Roe versus Wade passed. So by then I was pro-choice for a minute. Woman has a right to choose what she does with her body. I, you know, I was saying all this. And then in the mid-70s, I ended up divorced from my first husband because I was post abortive mad, angry, uh, feminist, all of this. And I was dating and not courting. And I got pregnant. But guess what happened? It was, uh, abortion was legal. By then, I was just going to go to Planned Parenthood and just get an abortion. So I said to the baby's daddy, I'm going down to Planned Parenthood, I'm getting an abortion. He said, no, you're not. I'm a medical student. That's 46 chromosomes, 23 from me and 23 from you. I want mine back alive. Now, this was a black man who says this, right? He did. So I was the darling of granddaddy's eye. He had saved me from abortion. I didn't know what he saved me from. That was a secret. But I know that he had said to my mother, no. And uh, no, baby, that's my great-grandchild. You can't do that. So I went ahead and got what was called an ultrasound. And that baby was younger than the two that had been aborted and the one I had lost by um, miscarriage because my cervix had been damaged by the abortion. Because abortion hurts a woman's body. It doesn't just kill a baby. Sometimes the women die. You know, so I had gone through all that. But now I'm smiling, laughing. I'm in movies. I'm going to run for state legislator soon after that. All that, just smiling, happy, going to church on Sunday, but reading astrology when I got home and just all kind of things. So granddaddy said to me, nope, we're going to have that, baby. The daddy agreed. And so I got the ultrasound. He was younger than the ones who had been aborted and miscarriage. So I had probably what the world would call a functional nervous breakdown. Because I kept seeing the little babies that were gone. So I had to go then from the mid to late 70s all the way to married, had a couple of more children, state legislator, acting in movies with Burt Reynolds, all this kind of stuff. Very wealthy with my husband because he was an upcoming doctor. But something inside, I was trying to hide it, hide it, hide it. 1983, I became born again. I was just different, totally different. And I wanted Jesus so much that nothing else mattered. I repented of my sins. I forgave everyone who had wronged me. I asked God to have them forgive me. And I ended up having three uh, more children. So I have six living children and two um, aborted and one miscarried. So they're really nine. Philip, Jessica, and Raphael are in heaven. So I went on and I began teaching law, business law and all that as a professor. I had left the legislature by then. Uh, feminist, I ran against Andrew Young, not Andrew Young, Hosea Williams, um, several, several, uh, John Lewis actually won, but I ran for Congress. I left the state legislature and ran for Congress. And so Andy and all them, why don't you just stay at home and raise your children and all that? And I had a, a smart mouth too. I said, well, last time I looked, my brain was above my head, not below my head. I can run for office if I want to. USA Today, Alveda King Bill calls Andrew Yaga chauvinist, okay? So I went through all of that, but uh, then I became born again, became a college professor for 19 years. And I taught a class called Business Law out of West Law Books. And in that law book, there's a chapter, and the West Law Books Online probably still teach that. And so it had a chapter called Morals, Morals and Ethics. And I said, Morals and Ethics today, has America gone too far? A woman has a right to choose what she does with her body. The baby's not her body. Where's the lawyer for the baby? How can the dream survive if we murder the children? And so all the people who used to like me would give me money, acting parts in movies, all this kind of thing. They didn't want that anymore. And I still say, I don't care. God will take care of me. I had a short season before I learned about tithing and giving and all of that where 
I even had lack. It didn't matter. I kept going learning about tithe. One day, I, uh, my paycheck was just wasn't going to pay for everything. I laughed at the devil. I said, you know what? You are so right. I endorsed it, put the whole check in the offering, right? Next few days, somebody came by and brought me this, brought me that, brought me this. And increase began to grow. And so I was tithing, I was giving, living for the Lord. And um, hallelujah. I was a Democrat as a state legislator. I became an independent. Then I became a Republican. And I was a, an appointee by President George W. Bush. Went back to being an independent for me, because sometimes Republicans don't act right either. I hope you know it. They don't. Lord God, help us. And then the black Republicans say, well, come back to Frederick Douglass, Republican. And today I am registered as a Frederick Douglass Republican, and uh, President um, Donald Trump has appointed me to the Frederick Douglass Bicentennial Commission. Yes, yes. So, so that's my own testimony. What I want to show you real quick is a video tying the 20th century to the 21st century. And it's called Let Freedom Ring. I first wrote that song in 73, right when abortion became legal, all that. And uh, we are remixing it this year. It's going to come out in a different version. But I put some of the pictures from the 20th century civil rights movement because I want you to see when we were fighting over the lie of racism and skin color that we also needed to count the baby in the womb as a human being. And that's what we're doing in the 21st century. Free at last, free at last. Can we play Let Freedom Ring? And then we go.
God. Now, as you get your questions ready, we're going to take uh, maybe about 10 or 15 minutes of questions. I'm going to read two quotes. And uh, some of those pictures were Daddy, Uncle Emil, me growing up. And um, you saw the generations of the little boys and girls. We're the King family legacy. So um, thank you for watching that. I have two little quotes while you're writing your questions out. And go ahead, really, if you have some questions, please write them down. I will answer them for you on that yellow card where it says comments. Or you can also fill it out if you just want to get on my email list and things like that. All right, this one is from Mother Teresa, and uh, it's at the end of uh, one of her talks right after Roe versus Wade became law or right before. She says, I have no new teaching for America. I seek only to recall you to faithfulness to what you once taught the world. Your nation was founded on the proposition, very old as a moral precept, but startling and innovative as a political insight, that human life is a gift of immeasurable worth and that it deserves always and everywhere to be treated with the utmost dignity and respect. I, I urge the court to take the opportunity presented by the petition in these cases to consider the fundamental question of when human life begins and to declare without equivocation the inalienable rights which it possesses. And that would go with Senate Bill 425. So please work to, to support that. Martin Luther King Jr., in one of his speeches, I think it was a Christmas sermon. Now let me say that the next thing we must be concerned about, if we are to have peace on earth and goodwill towards men, is the nonviolent affirmation of the sacredness of all human life. Every man, and I would say every person, is somebody because every person is a child of God. And so when we say, thou shall not kill, we're really saying that human life is too sacred to be taken on the battlefields of the world. And the womb is a battlefield. If you don't know that, it is. Man is more than a tiny vagary of whirling electrons or a wisp of smoke from a limitless smoldering. Man, and that means men, women, and children, man is a child of God, made in God's image, and therefore must be respected as such. Until people see this everywhere, until nations see this everywhere, we will be fighting wars. One day, somebody should remind us that even though there may be political and ideological differences between us. The Vietnamese are our brothers, the Russians are our brothers, the Chinese are our brothers, and one day we've got to sit down together at the table of brotherhood, humanhood, okay? But in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, in Christ there is neither male nor female, in Christ there is neither communist nor capitalist, in Christ somehow there is neither bound or free. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And when we truly believe in the sacredness of the human personality, we won't exploit people. We won't trample over people with the iron feet of oppression. We won't kill anybody. So, you know, even the gun battles, and uh, please raise your hand if you heard this. I hope I wasn't the only one. There was a school principal. They said, we're just going to give the children rocks. Raise your hand if you heard it. Okay, now you take all the guns away, all the good people will give the guns away. The bad people are going to keep them. And then they show up and we're going to throw rocks. I'm not saying that guns are the answer. But also choke control, poison control, stomp you control. You see, human heart has to change. So if, raise your yellow card up in the air if you have a question on it. Okay, can somebody collect all of them really quickly for me and bring them to me? And I'm going to take just a few minutes. I'll answer any question I get. This is your time. Speak now and forever hold your peace. I will answer this. And then we're going to sing this little light of mine together. Can all the singers come stand behind me as soon as I finish the question, I'll call you. We're going to do this little light of mine. And you know what? My pastor used to say, don't sing this little light. Your light's not little, it's big. It actually is. If we turn off all the lights in here and I have a match, 
you go see that match, right? So light is light. The people in darkness really have seen a great light. But think how big it is if we all light our light at the same time. You see? Okay, I'm just going to go. I'm not going to call your name out. I'm just going to answer your question. And if you had a note on here that you want to get on my email list, we'll, we'll do that too. We'll get that done. Okay, thank you. Okay. Share on Facebook, debate and teach. Do you think the Roe versus Wade that will that Roe versus Wade will ever be eradicated? Why do you think God has allowed it so long and not destroyed America? God really is patient. Because if any of us made a decision, we'd be gone. God is patient, but God used to wink at sin. God doesn't wink at sin anymore. So it is coming, you know, pretty. It's got to stop. It actually has to stop. God is patient. God is loving. God really is kind. But it does run out. So we have an obligation. We must deal with it now. Okay. How many of your family members in your age group are conservatives and speak out for godly conservative values? It's not. They are probably not. They're liberal. I am conservative. But we fight over liberal and conservative. God doesn't have a Republican card, Tea Party card, Democrat card, Libertarian card. Some of this goes so far beyond conservative and liberal. But if the values which are conservatives line up with the Bible, that's where we belong. And is it because we have a label conservative or is it because it's the right thing? We have to get not vote loyally for a party that's killing babies because you're loyal. It's just bigger than that. It's bigger. You can actually be an independent and vote for what you believe, and it lines up with the Bible. You can actually do that, too. So it don't get so bound into, you know, Thanksgiving. Sometimes people get indigestion because they're taking the turkey leg off and fighting with it. Bam, bam, bam. You going to line up with me, or I'm going to hit you with this turkey leg. <laughs> no, no, no. It does, that's not what we're supposed to do. So, uh, you know, some of my kids are actually conservative. And I think some of my other relatives are. They just don't go around and say it. I think they are. Because, you know, how do you know what people really do when they go in the voting booth? You see? So vote the Bible. Just vote the Bible. Um, encouragement. Um, I have two aborted daughters, both birth mothers. Uh, got off the abortion. Uh, two, I think, adopted, two adopted daughters. Both birth mothers got off the abortion table three times. Your sacrifice and service are making a difference. Well, praise be to God. Praise be to God. And adoption is a beautiful option. It's a beautiful option. Um, how do you reach post-abortive women in the church so they can be free and used by God in the church? Well, here it's probably pretty easy because you're being taught and there are classes and things like that. But if it's, if it's out in other areas, quietly, silently, go to the pastor, first lady, leaders, and say, you will not be hurting our feelings if you teach us the truth. Please teach us the truth and do not condemn us. And I, I have to say this, and I'm going to close my eyes, because it's not happening here. I'm not even worried about it here. It's just totally not happening, and I know that all day. But if the pastor is the one that's helping the girls getting pregnant and then paying for her abortion, the pastor needs to stop. And if you are not a member of this church because it's not happening here, if it's happening at your church, you go tell your pastor I told you to tell him that. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> In your opinion, and first lady, stop doing this too. It's not happening here. But sometimes the first ladies go and slip and take the girls and don't even tell their mama. I know that to be true, so no. And think they're helping the girl. Uh-uh, no. In your opinion, what would be the single most important thing a person and a church could do to turn the tide of abortion? First, pray continually, tell the truth, teach the word. Faith comes by hearing, and you're washed by the washing of the word. Plead the blood of Jesus. Do what's right. And as it, it, one person does something right, another person joins another person, it becomes, that's what we, it, it becomes a bonfire of truth. Okay. And why do you feel people are so um, relevant Christians? I don't know. I don't, I don't, reluctant. Why are we reluctant? Just kind of get stuck and in shame and, oh, God doesn't forgive me, and you know, all kind of things. We are forgiven. This Jubilee is 50. It's 50 years since Martin Luther King died. 
Jubilee, freedom, liberty. This is a good time to just be free. And pastor will tell you how to get free. And first lady and the leaders that you can be free. You sure can. Got two more. Um, visiting your uncle's memorial in D.C. Is there one thing uh, you would remove? You know, I told my family, my family where they were doing that. Yeah, they said, here she goes again. Because I really wasn't going to go. Because that's why I wrote Let Freedom Ring in 1973. People were trying to make an idol out of Martin Luther King. That's why God hid the body of Moses, because he knew y'all would be going to the Moses Memorial right now. If you could find it, you would. So that's why there is no Moses Memorial, okay? So I told him, I said, I might go, because y'all keep saying you want me to go, but I'm not sitting on the front row, because when God knocks that head off that statue and it falls down here and knocks y'all out, I'm not letting that hit me. So in that particular year, they were going to push abortion. They were going to march for abortion as an equal right, gay marriage, all this. So we were at a luncheon first, and the, the pastor, a man, gets up. And Patty LaBelle had, was singing at a concert, you could be a man or a woman. A man could be a man or a woman, all this. And then this preacher gets up. So I jump up from the table, and I'm getting ready to start prophesying. At the bill, at my daughter grabbed my cup, sit down, Ma, sit down, sit down. So I let her do that because several months before that, we had been in Atlanta, and we were marching uh, for life with Father Pavone and all of them. And they, the uh, pro boys were there, and I got upset because they were trying to go around the tomb of Martin Luther King and all that. I jumped in the pool in my blue jeans and shirt and all that, and I started prophesying. Let freedom ring. Let righteousness roll down this water. I'm marching back and forth in the reflecting pool. And the people to look at. So my daughter knew I was getting ready to turn the, the luncheon out. So she made me sit down. So guess what happened? The night before, they were going to have the big demonstration. In Washington, D.C., there was a turn, tornado and an earthquake. It split the Washington Monument. So the leaders of that thing, I looked at them. I said, I tell you what, you insist on going and doing it anyway. The whole earth is just going to crack open, and some of y'all are going to fall in it. I did prophesy then. So they looked at me. So he looked at everybody at the table. He says, well, if there was a hurricane, not a turn out, it was a hurricane. If there was a hurricane or an earthquake, we could probably still do this. But since it's a hurricane and an earthquake, we must call it off. I stood up from the table. I said, good, the weather's going to be pretty tomorrow. Next day, the weather looked like nothing had happened. So my whole family walked around looking at me half scared. I said, I tried to tell y'all, you know, but you made me come. I didn't do it. This was the spirit of the living God because the saints all over the world, we're saying we are not going to make a mockery of this. Martin Luther King Jr. was not a perfect man, and I don't think you can find one in the Bible except Jesus. Okay? But he served a perfect God. And you remember that when... On April 4th, they got, you know, an FBI, because uh, Hoover hated my uncle so badly. And he was so jealous of him and all that. And a lot of the stuff they said, they really totally made it up. And if you don't believe in fake news, what's that movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington? Anybody ever seen it? Raise your hand. And if you haven't, please rent it. It's very old. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And the news mounted an attack against him. That's exactly what fake news does. So a lot of the junk that they will say about my uncle Martin Luther King Jr. just wasn't true. But he wasn't perfect. He would tell you that himself. Jesus is perfect, okay? So, um, but Jubilee, 50 years. My grandfather had 10 children, my dad, five, my wife and I. We made love more than two, more than trying to prevent. Uh, they use birth control. Is that the same thing? Oh, a natural family planning. If a woman does not have sex when she's ovulating she can't have a baby and just like you can get a pregnancy test now you can get an ovulation kit it's so easy so that's really true and so a long time ago 40 and under they had a procedure called a rabbit test and so they had to take some fluid from the mother shoot it in the rabbit if the rabbit died she was pregnant now, good lord but wait a minute, if you're older than 50, if you don't mind telling the truth, is that, did, 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 did they used to have a rabbit test? Anybody ever heard of a rabbit test? Raise your hand. It was the craziest test you ever heard of. 
But now, you know, but you need to be moral. You don't need to be running. You know, and sex is not bad when it's a man married to a woman. God's way, as a matter of fact, is probably wonderful. But it's under those conditions. Miles Monroe, before he left, he said, if you misuse a thing for the purposes used, you can get hurt or unsatisfied and every kind of thing, whatever. If you try to take a blow dryer because your heat went out and you didn't pay the bill and you put all the children under the sheet and turn on the blow dryer, what's going to happen? Y'all got to electrocute yourselves. Just think about it. Use things for the purpose they are intended. And I hope you don't get mad because I'm going to tell the truth. I tried to stay away from it. Two men, two ladies, that's not the purpose. I'm sorry, it just doesn't work right. And then love, you know, say, well, what about love? Love and sex are really not the same thing. They just aren't. So we need to learn the purpose of everything. Pray that I learn the real purpose of food. Okay? I don't live to eat. I eat to live. And God told me one time, and I'm through, for real. I was singing. I was 316 pounds. Now I'm about... 70 something. Doctor said it was pretty good because it's about 270 something. So I'm like, I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. And then I had a whole Pepperidge Farm cake at home in the refrigerator. <laughs> So I'm thinking, I worship you, but I'm thinking about the peppers for our cake. And I did go home and eat the whole cake that night. So pray for me, too. Okay. I don't do that anymore. The hotel tried to give me four of those cookies over there. I said, no, thank you. I did get one. No, take three or more. No. So whatever it is. And I don't know. Can the worship team join me, though? Let's do I worship you, almighty God, for real. Come on. Y'all can lead it. Can you just sit there? We're going to be done in four and a half minutes. We're going to do a round of that. Can y'all come on? Can, who, who can lead our worship you, Almighty God? Who can? Okay, let's go. Here we go. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my right. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. Now stay there. We're going to do this little light of mine and I'm done. Okay. Pick it up however you do that. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. 